it um, as the teacher, then you can when when the that your Zoom is recorded. If you're being if you're recording, then um, that person, you as the teacher, are the one who's if, if any images or if any pictures show up of people's faces, it will be you as the teacher and not student faces. Okay. Spotlight. All right, we are going to jump into the curriculum now. And like Charlotte said before here, if you're in the slides, here's the normal unit two outline and then here's the distance learning version so that you can kind of compare them against each other. So I think that all of you have been to the summer class um, at some point in time. It looks like from our intro that most of you are in you know, year two, year three of implementation or feel relatively comfortable. But I, but I think that Stephanie is first year with patterns. And Stephanie, have you taken the summer class? No, I haven't. Okay, so we do think that it's um, important just to mention that all the curricula that use the patterns approach have been designed with a set of design principles. And they're listed here. I'm not gonna read them for you, but it is important that, um, that we just keep, all, even though we're in comprehensive distance learning, that we keep these principles in mind, that we're trying to keep things and activities as student-centered as possible keeping students collaborating as much as possible, trying to implement um, pattern style labs. And those of you who are familiar with the whole sequence, you know that sequence from sort of wild guess and then back down to, um, you know, answering that wild guess question at the end of the lab. Um, so, we're not going to go into these patterns approach design principles in detail here, but we've linked the two page summary and then the full version, which I think is, you know, four or five pages. So if you are newer to patterns or if you feel like you need a refresher about the design principles that kind of it helps kind of explain why things are designed the way they are and in the order in which they're laid out. Um, just a good resource for you as a reminder. So of course, here we are today, going to be reviewing some of the, um, the arc from unit two. And the big essential question around um, our biomolecules unit, it has to do with metabolism, right? How do cells make the molecules that they need and get rid of the ones that they don't need? What happens if the steps in this process aren't working? So if you're coming from a more traditional approach where really, in, in my view, kind of had us looking how I had teachers and students looking at biomolecules really in isolation. For me, there was never, I never felt that there was really a connection. What we're trying to do here is to um, use those, you know, talk, talk and learn about those bio, biomolecules, but give students some context. And so that means that we're bringing in things that were not necessarily originally part of like a kind of a traditional biomolecules chapter, right? If you think of like back to what you would have experienced as a student or maybe early in your teaching career, if you were following a textbook, you would have a first chapter in your book that would have been about like the characteristics of life. And then the second chapter in the book would have been about molecules of life, right? So here we're actually going to be jumping ahead and you'll see that there are we include, for example, DNA and protein synthesis in this unit, which traditionally might not have been until, you know, a little bit later in your year. So metabolism is the theme um, and we incorporate um, a variety of different activities, of course, that try to pull at different components of that idea. So one of the main things about science teaching and kind of a big buzzword right now in science teaching is phenomena, right? So making sure that we're using um, an anchoring phenomenon and then having little phenomena along the way that can help to come back by the end of the unit to help explain what's going on in that anchoring phenomenon. So um, if you're uh, in the beginning of your unit, it's really a good idea to have students have some kind of connection to some situation, something that they could imagine or connect to as the anchoring phenomenon. So uh, on the next slide, I'm gonna detail 
in task set one, what we do to rep to, or what we suggest as the anchoring phenomenon for unit one. So um, the first part of the unit is really based on HSLS 1.6, which is identifying what the biomolecules are and making some art, having students make arguments and explanations about why, how atoms come together in this way and the understanding about um, carbon-based molecules. So we suggest to use a scenario that has come from the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science out of the University of Buffalo in New York. And, and we've adapted the scenario a little bit to make it a little bit uh, smoother around the edges to be a little bit more potentially culturally responsive to student situations. And this is a scenario, we've linked it here, we don't have time to go over all of the whole thing, but the scenario is basically, there are some uh, new parents, the baby is born, everything seemed to be fine, but then after a few days, the baby seems to have be in under some distress. And they take the baby to the hospital, they run some tests, tests don't initially come back with anything uh, glaringly obvious, and then at the end of the scenario, we realize that there's the, the mother brings a diaper with her to the hospital and says to the doctor, does this smell in the diaper have anything to do with what's going on here? And so we also learn within that scenario that in previous generations of the family, there were uh, deaths of infants. And so you can imagine that there might be a little, you might have to adapt this scenario depending on your students perhaps, but we've tried to make it as, or to, uh, to adjust it to be as neutral as possible while still sticking to the main idea of the story. So at this point, the idea is that students are really just asking questions. They're in introduced to the scenario and then we use Jamboard, Jesse's gonna click on the link so we can show you um, what that, looks like, and just very similar to what we just did with introductions, students would actually work in small groups just verbally to establish some questions, and then they pick their questions, their best questions from their small group and post them on the Jamboard. So you might end up with maybe 15 or 20 questions in your class, but it's like the curated questions, like the best questions you know, as the groups have selected. So again, in this Jamboard, there are multiple panels. Um, and that line really, those lines are meant for students to actually move the sticky notes around so that similar questions get grouped together. And so, for example, a very common set of questions is around genetic disorders. Oh, is there something going on in the genes in this family? Oh, clearly something's happened in the previous generations of this family. Is that what's happening with baby Matthew? So that's a very common set. A lot of them get very focused on what's in the diaper. They assume that it's the feces, but it's not. that's not specifically said in this scenario. So the idea here is that students can see what other groups are thinking, but they've also had a chance before we're asking them to put anything in this scenario, or in this, sorry, in this question board, they've had a chance to actually verbally discuss it with some peers before asking them to put it here. Um, and at the end of every, I'll just point it out, at the end of every task set, we have developed something called a unit tracker. And it's just kind of a way, especially in CDL, for students to have a place to track their thinking as they go through the unit. So we'll show you at the very end of this, and also it's linked in the unit plan, um, we have a standalone version of that tracker, like just one Google Doc by itself. And then we also, in the interactive notebook, have a copy of that tracker so that if you're using the interactive notebook, um, you don't have to make that again. I personally am using the interactive notebook because I like students to have all of their learning in one location or access to all of their learning in one location. So that's what that means at the end of every task that you'll see students fill out the tracker. Show, we can show you that at the end. So the introduction is pretty quick and it hasn't really changed very much from previous versions. If you've been to summer training when we, when we looked at that, um, except what we, if we were in person, we might do it with sticky notes and the Jamboard is the um, 
at the edit or the conversion for CDL. So then we go, the, the suggested next part of the arc is to engage students in learning about some biomolecules. And if you're familiar, can I just see, um, maybe in the chat, you can put the, a number that tells, like how many, how many different classes, physics, chemistry, and biology in patterns have you taught or are you familiar with? So I know some people are in smaller districts and may have taught all three courses. Obviously you're here because you're teaching the biology course. I'm just curious if any of you have taught any of the other courses. So if you have only taught biology, you would put a one in the chat. If you taught biology and chemistry or physics, you would put a two. And if you've taught all three, you would put a three. Okay, so it looks like we have some people who are teaching only biology and some people who are teaching or have taught multiple subjects. The, the reason I ask that is because this idea of the inquiry cube is a, an activity that exists in all three courses. So it would be important for you to know if you're only teaching biology, if students in your school have taken other classes in the patterns approach, they would have seen an inquiry cube before, but it's obviously not the same inquiry cube. So this inquiry cube was developed specifically for biology and the patterns that are on it are all related to biomolecules. So we did revise this or update it for CDL um, so that all, instead of actually physically seeing the inquiry cube in front of them, we've made a slideshow that has different images in that, in the, in the slideshow and that what you're seeing in the corner there is just one example. So we of course had to flatten out the inquiry cube in order for them to be able to see all the pieces. And the idea is to try and figure out, of course, what's on the bottom. So the pink pair is a little hard to see there, but the pink pair is amino acid and protein. The blue pair is carbohydrate and sugar. Sorry, I did that backwards, sugar and carbohydrate. And then you have nucleotide on the top. And so on the bottom, it would be DNA. So it's monomer, monomer polymer pairs. They're also looking at structures. For example, you can see, well, you look a little, it's hard to see on this slide, I had to make it kind of small, but you have the shapes of molecules are, we're trying to make those obvious here. Um, there are patterns with the numbers of letters in the word. And so some of them are really biologically and chemically oriented patterns. Some of them are not. So kind of allows students what we like to call multiple entry points on this task because they don't necessarily have to know science or a lot of science to be successful on this task. And they're of course also working in a group to accomplish it. And then following that task, there's a pattern matching task where students are given a whole bunch of different biomolecules, different examples of amino acids, different examples of um, nucleotides and sugars and um, and so they are then just by sight, just by what they see, um, classifying these molecules. So we have two versions of this. It's again done with Jamboard. Um, do you want to show the number two, Jesse, the version two? Uh, I did it with all of the molecules. You may be familiar with this pattern matching activity. If you search pattern matching biomolecules on Google, it, it's something that's been out there for a while. I used to do it with like cards. So if you did it, like Alicia, I know when, I, when you took the class, we did this with, we did it actually with physical cards, like cut out of card stock. Um, so we've converted it to a jam board. So Jesse, can you move on to the next slide? So you can see that there are like all these different um, biomolecules there and there are multiple panels of them. And what students would do in their small group is to cut them out on one panel and place them onto another panel based on similarities in structure. This so, one, this version, we kind of pared it down. I think the original one has like 50 molecules in it. I think this one, we pared it down to about half that. So there are two versions. You could do it with all of the molecules present, or you could do the kind of pared down version where we haven't shown every single amino acid, for example, just like six or seven amino acids, and two or I seven acids. I want to point out what Charlotte said. So this isn't a whole class activity. This is, they're in small groups and they each get a copy of this Jamboard and they're working in their small groups together to do this. 
Right. Otherwise, you know, trying to, yeah, trying to have 30 kids working on this task together would be very difficult. Makes a lot more, uh, makes it a lot more manageable if they're doing it in a group of three or four. So that's kind of their introduction to the existence of biomolecules and like gets them a little bit familiar with the vocabulary. And then um, the next, uh, the next part of the arc would be to, to, this is where we bring in the idea of metabolism. So how do these molecules get broken or put together? How do those polymers get made from those monomers that we now kind of understand those pairs? And so um, in the, sorry, I'm just gonna reach over here for my molecule kit. In the in-person learning, we might do, you, you know, build biomolecules with a biomolecule building kit or with toothpicks and um, marshmallows, for example. But we obviously can't do that. Can't make sure that everybody has access to those materials. So we have um, made a revised or a revised version of, a, of this activity that is based on some GIFs. Well, there's a, there's a short film and then GIFs that are based on that film. So there are a lot of things in this activity in this Google Doc that are very similar to what was in existence before, but can you scroll down, Jesse, a little yeah, bit we're just to waiting. show the GIF? It's just loading. So you can see, uh, let's see, hopefully it will, hopefully it will load. You can do it. Uh, yeah, right, come on. Well, oh, there we go, good. So it's a little bit slow to see it over Zoom, but this GIF is embedded into the Google Doc. So the students, when they're looking at their Google Doc, they will see that GIF actually play. And this is based, based on what they have seen in the film. Um, for some reason that one's on a different page, but. I don't know how that happened. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So and then this is another one. So you have one that sets up hydrolysis and the other one that shows dehydration synthesis. And then they're working with their group to analyze what's happening there. And there's some guided questions that they're filling out during that time. So it's not, I mean, it's nicer to be able to build with the molecules and actually see those, but that's not possible in CBL. So, and then we, uh, it's kind of an assessment pause. Um, and we can talk maybe a little, little bit more about assessment later, depending on your um, interest, um, interest level and question, what questions you have. So there is a quiz there, but I don't know about you guys, but I have not found a way to do a test that uh, eliminates all opportunities for cheating or my nice good questions being out there. And I'm a little bit reluctant to put those questions out there because they took a long time to produce. <laughs> so um, we, I think, have decided in Beaverton that we're not going to be doing traditional testing and quizzing. Um, and so we just wrote this biomolecules and nutrition infographic task. And full disclosure, like the rubric is not done, <laughs> but but we're assigning it on Monday. So it will be done by then. <laughs> um, but that's a new thing and what we're trying to do is to to have students will take the knowledge that they've learned about biomolecules and also bring in knowledge that they've learned about nutrition from their health class and analyze their own um their own nutrition for a day and then they're making an infographic about why and the the essential question of the assignment is oh good Good. Oh, Alicia, can you send that or take a picture and send that, whatever that is to us, because we're looking for any kind of resources. Oh, we can't hear you. Muted. I might have something I can send your way at the end of class. Yeah, that would be amazing because we're... I'm doing the same idea. I have the same similar concept going. Anyway. Cool. That's great. Thank you, because it's whenever you're trying to, you know, we're all trying to figure out these alternative kinds of assessments because we know that traditional tests and quizzes are not gonna work under these circumstances. So we'd love, love to see whatever you have so we can cobble it together for Monday. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, um, moving on to task set four. 
I, uh, so this is technically our enzyme unit, but the actual enzyme um, learning target that we have in there is not an NGSS standard. Um, so we have these little, in the unit planner, if you're heading along, you see in bold at the top, it says, this is not a priority task set. Um, so just know that those are not NGSS um, targets, but we have them in there because like, typically we, enzymes are important in this unit, um, but it's a choice for you and your team. So personally on my team, we are doing enzymes and not doing the um, engineering project at the end of the year, just because of some of our student needs. Um, so that's just a, a decision that you're going to have to make with, with your team. So the enzyme lab is really the same as it has always been. If you guys have done a classic catalase lab, um, the biggest differences are that Charlotte and I made videos to collect data. Um, so you'll see my face holding up test tubes where they collect data um, instead of them doing it themselves. And then we have this data discussion template. Instead of doing a whiteboard meeting, this is kind of our version of an online whiteboard meeting so that they can see everyone's data all together. So everything is hyperlinked up here. So teaching students how to use hyperlinks, all of that kind of good stuff. But what will happen yeah, the, is- Sorry, the, yeah, the table of contents is gonna be key. We are learning about using table, you know, using this kind of listing at the top of a document as a table of contents, linking things within the document so that we don't have to say at the top of page four. And then of course, some kids have moved things around already. And so much easier to try and get this set up in advance that way. So the idea is that you put them out into groups and each group member has a specific color that they're writing in so that I can hold my students accountable for what they're saying um, and who's kind of writing what and know kind of where ideas are coming from during our, our data discussion. So I'm just gonna use our hyperlinked table up here. And so what will happen is if I'm in the catalase enzyme concentration group, right, I will make my graph I will put them here and I will kind of answer all of these questions. What range should we test? What was the optimum? And there are two sets of videos. So they might be a little bit different. Um, it's not like they're analyzing the same video every time, group one and two. So then from this information, the catalase group will come through and I'll type depending on my color, right? I'm always gonna type in my color my responses to these kinds of questions. And so then that allows you as a teacher to come back and look at what students are thinking, talk about it as a class and, and come together in some kind of a whiteboard-ish meeting. Yeah, and this, so my, um, my son is a student in another school in our district and I observed this in action in his chemistry class. So what I observed were a first that the color thing, because we set up, we tried to set up the colors in advance. So if assuming that students don't mess around with them, they work relatively well. Um, but sometimes students are not paying attention to that. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as the teacher. The, and the, really the color is more for you. It's so that you as the teacher can see, oh, well in group one, all four kids are answering. In group two, all four kids are answering. Now, can they change the colors? Yes, <laughs> right. But it's that we, if you have any other bright ideas about how we can help keep kids accountable for participation, we would love to hear them. This is what was our best, <laughs> our best effort uh, under these uh, under these circumstances. Oh, good, Laura. That's cool. You guys are doing kits. Good luck with getting all of your test tubes back. That's ah uh, yeah okay <laughs> yeah so we so the the videos with the videos uh, we did we we ran we ran the lab eight times this summer, twice for temperature, twice for pH, twice for enzyme concentration, twice for substrate concentration. So 
um, if you're not in a situation where students can do this lab from home, those videos are there. And then we also thought it was a great thing for the future, like even when we're back in person, to be able to send home those videos as uh, for students maybe who are not able to be at school that day. It avoids you as a teacher having to go and like offer the after school opportunity for them to run the lab because you can send them home with the video or send the videos home and say, analyze these data. Or, and they have to actually collect the data too. So we hold up the ruler, but we don't read the ruler for them. They actually have to read the ruler to measure the phone. So. So if you're not doing the lab, our small option to just say, hey, enzymes are a thing and they make and break molecules is just this small amoeba sisters video and a note taker, just to get them thinking that there are little machines that, that do the work of metabolism. And the idea of enzymes comes or enzymes comes back a little bit later in this task set um, when they talk about the different kind when we learn about the different kinds of proteins that exist. Okay, so as Charlotte said before, um, we do do uh, DNA and uh, protein synthesis in this unit. So this we're, we only have 25 minutes left, it goes so fast. Okay, um, this is a revised worksheet that really is just talking about DNA structure. Um, it's kind of getting them to think about char gas rules, recognize patterns, um, and just look at the structure of DNA. So that again is kind of like the other online worksheets that we have shown you. I do want to click on this one though because I think this is an important one to look at. Well, and it, it's, it's new and really relevant right now. Yeah. So we have tried to embed anti-racist, anti-bias teaching um, in almost all or all of the units um, that we do in biology. And so this is a great place since we're introducing DNA um, to talk about the idea of DNA and race and what that means. Jesse, can so, you uh, go to like 150% so we can see a little bit better, please? Thank you. Is that better? Much better, thank you. So this article is not long, um, but it is good. So they just kind of read through this article and uh, reflect on these questions. I would probably, I don't know if you have like a reflection template. We use Canvas and Beaverton. So I would probably set this up in a discussion board. Um, so you could do that. You could have them do it individually and then come back and talk about it in class. But it's really getting them to think about, right, some of these historic false assumptions that scientists have had over the years about DNA and racism. And it does a great job of pointing out all of those misconceptions um, and how, how we should be rethinking some of those things as we go through. And I would just say, not to suggest that anyone would um, do this, but it's really important, I think, that, that as the teacher, uh, as teachers, that we be intimately connected to the contents of that article before you assign it. Because obviously this is a situation and a topic where there could be potential pitfalls in the and in how but in the, the the way that the discussion potentially goes in the class so um whereas we've all taught dna structure before you might be able to assign that task without really looking super closely at it i mean we're all going to be honest here we're all overworked right now this is not one where you want to do that you really need to dive deep into that article and be very very aware of all of its components before assigning it. And you may look, look at this task and say, some of these questions are great for my students and then others I need to adapt. So we encourage you to modify in, you know, for your students, but I would not recommend removing this. Our district has taken a very clear anti-racist um, from all the way from the superintendent this year. They made a commitment to infusing this type, these types of topics in, into all content areas. I and know. So, I know that um, some parent involvement, especially in distance learning, has happened. Um, I know I got a parent email saying, "Hey, I heard in your class the other day 
Um, so I think questions like this are important to point out in those kinds of conversations also. Like we're talking about the biological, the scientific, the data-driven differences in what is happening in the evidence um, instead of that social meaning. So really getting students and parents to see that, that we're talking biology here. Okay, so there's that reading. And then uh, a quick investigation about proteins and how they're made, um, overviewing the different types of proteins it kind of goes through, um, and then overviewing the, the concept of protein synthesis. Again, we are not worried about the nitty gritty details of protein synthesis. We really just want to know um, that the DNA is the code that is read to put amino acids together in a specific way. So yeah, so I, I revised this and uh, the feedback I got was what? No transfer RNA? And I was like, well, how would you effectively teach transfer RNA under CDL? <laughs> and really, if you're thinking about reading a codon wheel, the transfer RNA is not there. And that adds a level of complexity that is can be confusing for students even under the best of in-person conditions. And so, um, I made a conscious choice along with the team to take that out. So, but I also looked very, very closely at the performance expectations and it says very clearly the, that the, the biochemical mechanism of protein synthesis is too deep for this topic. So we got to keep, I mean, the reality is we have less time. I mean, in Beaverton, we're being asked, we're being asked to, to keep our you know, direct instruction to 30 minutes or less in a 70 minute period. And we're used to 90 minutes. So there are, are you know, things that we have to, that we, we can't do everything. So that is what they're, you know, one of the things that you might notice as something that's um, removed or, you know, different in this, um, in this version. So something else I wanted to point out is that this tax set in the, in the non-distance learning version is very long. <laughs> um, so we decided to break it up here. We will probably do the same, I mean, don't quote me, but I think we will probably do the same thing in the other one. So we decided to break it up into DNA and protein synthesis, and then really put at the end, this whole idea of mutations, what that means for traits, how is that different? Um, so here students go through this muscular dystrophy activity um, to investigate the types of mutations. So this is the same um, from when it was in non-CDL. And then here in this gene expression um, activity, we actually, this I'm going to use it as, as an assessment. So students read this gene expression activity, kind of take some notes and then make a, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of, Charlotte? where you <laughs> concept map, there it is. <laughs> so I'll just this show you that. Is, yeah, this is based on a based on a medical situation and where the uh, a young woman basically never goes through puberty. Um, and it turns out to be because she has a mutation in her estrogen receptor gene. So if you've done this article has been in the curriculum for a while, but we did make modifications to the um, to the tasks that we're asking students to do to make it a little bit more CDL friendly and also to give it as an option as a as, as a academic evidence. So they do this concept map and then write um, a claim evidence reasoning, talking about all the way from DNA to trait. Right? How does how does that whole line kind of work? And again, it's a human situation. So trying to make it as relevant as possible for students to see how these things actually play out in humans. Okay. I wanna be conscious of your time. So yes. moving on, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, okay, uh, coming back to the anchoring phenomenon. So this is, we've learned all of the things that could have been wrong with baby Matthew. Um, so this is our chance to kind of figure those things out. So this is the same as it is in the non-distance learning version. 
Um, we have a slides template for CER sharing. There's also the go formative about the inborn errors of the metabolism. So they look at that big metabolism chart, but only a small section of it. And they're broken up into groups and they try to determine if their enzyme, if their disease, if their metabolic um, mutations are what is wrong with baby Matthew. Um, so this is kind of the fun part is it's challenging for students, but if you keep supporting them through it and um, they end up doing a great job and they get to decide what's wrong with baby Matthew at the end, like this is their, the fruit of their labor, right, of learning all of this information. Okay, I think this is the same as non-distance learning, so I'm just going to move on to our uh, engineering project. So we still have yogurt. Okay, yogurt is um, generally the same, except for we have some, hey, here's different ways to make yogurt. Pick your best way that you can do at home. Um, and there's videos in there for them to go off of and just kind of pick the way that it works best for them. And then we also have a bread engineering template if that is easier. So I know that getting packets, like Laura was talking about, like getting kits out. Um, I know that getting kits probably for bread is a little easier than yogurt. Bob's Red Mill is like a local business who might be able to donate yeast or flour um, so you might look into, into getting flour donated. Yeah. King Arthur, King Arthur also has a, um, one of their factories is, is in Washington and they have, a, if you just go to kingarthurflour.com, they actually have a, like a donation page where you can request, um, request that kind of thing that they would like send flour to your school. Now you'd have to like pack it, package it up for distribution, um, but there are some options out there for getting donations. And if you're starting unit two, like now would be the time to like probably ask for that if you're looking to produce those um, packets. This, the bread project actually came out uh, of North Bend. So North Bend High School, we had several participants from North Bend High School over the, over, I don't know, five, six years ago in the summer course. And they developed Erica Street and Jen Hample out there in North Bend created this bread project. And then we, uh, you know, using the yogurt project as a, um, as a basis, and they did, they made the bread one. And then um, Jesse made some modifications to make it a little bit easier for CDL in terms of um, choices for kids. All right. And that is unit two. So we wanted yeah, I wanted to talk, you know, we can't do something about patterns without talking about some of those design principles that I mentioned earlier. And so I want to just briefly talk a little bit about differentiation. And so the question that I want you to think about, and you can either unmute and say, or write in the chat if you prefer, um, how do options or choices help with differentiation? And this is not just differentiation for kids, right? Like within your classroom, the differentiation that you need to do. But it's important that all people who are using patterns curricula know, and that I think it's really important that we say explicitly that in your buildings or your district, depending on size, right, scale, you have agency to make decisions that are best for you and for your kids. We're trying in the unit planners to provide some options for, to help facilitate that. So these choices, right, for teachers and for students and giving, you know, giving sort of, I, I don't wanna say like our blessing for flexibility, like that, we, I hope that that has been clear from the beginning that it is never our intention to say, you know, these are the only choices, right? But giving options and trying to make, give that flexibility and give you agency to make those decisions for your community. I think that's really important for us to just say that out loud right now, especially under the circumstances that we are under. It's been true all the time, but especially now. We wanna do think, However, it's important to say that 
there should be consistency within your team in our view in terms of anchoring activities like major some major things in the unit should probably be the same within your department or your you know the, the team of teachers who are teaching the course in your school but not every school is going to choose the same path like jesse and i work very closely together her team and her school has decided that they're going to do the enzyme lab we at my school are not going to do that we're going to do allow students to have the choice for the engineering project instead so there keep in mind that those flexible options are there for you but it's really important for us to support each other as teachers within our buildings and to alleviate some of that workload by making some of those decisions as school teams so not only differentiation for kids but differentiation among schools or districts potentially also So speaking of choices, right, we have this kind of um, summary of assessment options at the very bottom of the unit planner um, that, right, so I would just go through with your team maybe and pick one from each, right, like what are the big options here that we are going to assess, what are our anchoring kind of projects that we're going to do and then how are we going to get there. Um, so that's what my, me and my team did um, and kind of why we chose the, the enzyme inquiry just because it worked better for our students and their accessibility. Some other supports, right? So we have some interactive notebooks here. We have a document version and a slides version. Um, full honesty about the slides version, I am trying a new thing from Alice Keeler. It's called Pile of Slides. I, Alicia's like nodding her head. I'm, it's amazing, but the formatting is a little different than what has been on there previously. And I am currently making this slides version as I go. So it's not done yet, but it will be. But, but the advantage with the pile of slides, I have not been using it. I've been using the document version of the INB, but I earlier in this week actually looked, finally watched the Alice Keeler's video about how to use pile of slides. The advantage with that is that you don't have to have your INB or your, your slideshow that you want to push out to students. You don't have to have that all done on day one. You can add slides to it and then those slides get pushed out when you decide as the teacher that you want to push them out. So that means that those documents for students get updated as you add slides. Like sometimes I'm only one day ahead of the kids. Right, and we have to acknowledge that that's okay, and this is a tool that allows that to happen in CDL without it being a time suck having students like go one place copy slides paste them somewhere else. Um, and also I automatically have viewing access because i'm the owner of all of their slides. That, that's so the other end here with me it's just ideal. Okay, and then here's the unit tracker um, that we were talking about to kind of track that arc. We are almost out of time. And so I think I think everyone's on the teachers only folder. Um, but if you're not, go ahead and just go to this bit.ly to request access to any keys or tests or student exemplars. Yeah, certainly if you certainly if you've taken the summer course, you have should have access to that already, the teachers only folder. I'm just gonna fix my uh Mm -hmm. I don't know the, the, those extra words at the end of the slide <laughs> where they came from. Okay, so we want to open it up for questions. We have seven minutes left. So any Q and A's, anything that you'd like us to go through in more detail, um, now is the time to ask. just like school. <laughs> oh, Alicia, are you, you muted? Are we supposed to talk out loud? <laughs> yeah, you can, yeah, you can unmute yourself. You can type in the chat if you're more comfortable. Here's what it was. I was wondering about the pacing. Um, I'm noticing that uh, you guys were very discreet about your pacing in terms of 
tasks that, you know, one, two, three, we're kind of working through the, uh, we actually tried to work through a schedule within our uh, district. And uh, we're s essentially having about one to one and a half days, essentially pretty much exactly what you guys are doing, almost exactly. Um, it's, it's nice to actually to see that it's matching. Um, uh, that's kind of good to see. Um, but uh, I just wondered um, how long you thought this unit would take. It sounds like we're using about the same amount of time. We have 60 minutes. Sounds like you guys have 70 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have um, my plan with my team. And again, it might be a little bit different for Jesse because they're doing the enzyme lab, which is going to take a few like extra time. Right. Um, we're anticipating. So just to clarify, we meet live four days a week and have asynchronous students have an asynchronous um, day one day a week. And so we are trying to like plan we, our asynchronous days in the middle of the week. Right. So we have to plan around that. Um, we are, I am looking at like 15 or 16 days in total. Um, and Alicia, what I am trying to do for simplification purposes for students is that I'm trying to not have them necessarily have to create more than one Google Doc task per day. Understand, understand. Yeah, that's probably- so like, understand so like on in protein synthesis for example like the dna structure thing would be one day then the um what's the next DNA sorry um, say it again dna and race oh yeah dna and race would be another day maybe two depending on like where it falls in the week like i might put that part of that on the asynchronous day if they're doing like a canvas discussion or something like that mm -hmm. then the protein synthesis part because it's like types of proteins and then the, um, the process, I might actually take two days for that. And then mutate the muscular dystrophy would be one day. And then the um, assessment around the estrogen receptor might be two days. Cool. So that is the, like, that's the heaviest part of this. And depending on when the engineering project would come in, that is also going to take a couple of days. If they're doing yogurt, it has to be at least an overnight because it's got to go back in the refrigerator and they can't eat it until it's been chilled. So <laughs> it might extend to 20 days. Uh, that's kind of, I think our goal is to shoot for about three weeks of a unit. This one might be a little longer, but know that unit three is- Oh yeah. A mini, yeah, unit three. super mini unit. <laughs> Yeah, mush yeah. that one real small. Yeah, yeah. so the, the webinar for unit three is probably going to come up relatively soon. So just be a, keep an eye out for that on your email um, because that one is going to be mini, mini, like just pulling it way back. And so we can kind of win, win some time back in unit three because some of those concepts that used to be in unit three are going to get pushed to genomics to because they just make, to, they make more sense there. Mm -hmm. So that sounds good. That sounds awesome. Yeah, last spring we um, last spring we didn't get to unit six at all in Beaverton. We were just taking things very very slowly um, because of the you know emergency nature of the educational intervention, <laughs> and so we're really being very explicit about taking things out earlier on in the year because we must get to unit six. We can't teach a biology course without teaching photosynthesis and respiration and climate and the biological components of climate change. So we've got to pull some things out elsewhere in order to make time, be sure we have time for that. It's, this is just a different situation this year. It's just different. It's just yep. making an adjustment. Um, yep. I got to go to another meeting, you guys. Thank you very much. This is Thank wonderful. You. You're welcome, Alicia. Anything we'll, else? We'll send that. Uh, I'll send some documents to you guys later. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Any other questions? It is nine fifty nine. Want to honor your time? All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Laura.